He was the sheriff of Erie County, New York, mayor of Buffalo, governor of New York, and the 22nd and 24th president of the United States. Author Troy Sinek says in his new book that Grover Cleveland was precisely the kind of self-made, scrupulously honest man that Americans often say they want as their president. However, writes Sinek, quote, we had him for eight years, and somehow we forgot him. In his book titled A Man of Iron, Troy Sinek, a former speechwriter for George W. Bush, notes that Cleveland, a Democrat, has become a minor icon for modern-day libertarians. Troy Sinek, because you were a speechwriter for George W. Bush and Newt Gingrich and others, I have to tell you in reading your book, the fact that jumped out more than anything was that Grover Cleveland memorized his inaugural address? <laughs> Indeed he did. In fact, there are testimonies from my witnesses because he is an unknown quantity when he comes to Washington in 1885 to be sworn in. The record suggests he had only been there once before in his life. And his entire political career, for the most part, had happened in the course of the, the three years prior to that. So the members of Congress watching him get up and give this speech, for most of them, this is the first time they've seen him. And there is a, a quote that's included in the book of a, a member of Congress realizing what he's doing as he gets up, folds his hands behind his back, and begins delivering the address. And the member remarks, God, what a magnificent gambler. <laughs> and this was characteristic of who Cleveland was the background as a lawyer, this was this was a man who really lent himself to to deep study and who could do this kind of rote memorization. One of the defining traits about him throughout his life is that he's just this extremely hard worker to, to the point of exhaustion. Well, as you point out, he was elected president twice, but not consecutively. In his second inaugural address, did you see anywhere that he memorized that also? You know, I had never seen explicit reference to the fact that he did that, but best I can tell, almost every set of public remarks he gave, which, by the way, were not many. I mean, he only gave one or two addresses every time he ran for president. In this day and age, he didn't give a State of the Union address. It was a set of written remarks. So it didn't happen very frequently, and it seems that in virtually every case we know of, this would have been a matter of, of memorization. And he also did all the research and all the writing himself. There is exactly one case in his entire political career where he used a ghostwriter. But for every other set of remarks or every other set of uh, written documents that he may have sent along, all in his own hand. Because he was president in the late 1800s, uh, we don't have a sense of what he sounded like except you say People were surprised that he had a high nasal tone in spite of the fact that he was a rather large man. Yeah, this is uh, literally the only documentary piece of evidence that I could find about somebody describing his voice. That people, you know, if you see Grover Cleveland, even now, in these old black and white photographs, this massive figure. I mean, he's not especially tall. He's about five foot eleven, but... We think he weighed in at about 275 pounds. He is generally ranked second only to William Howard Taft in terms of our heaviest presidents. And he is a, um, he is a well, coarse was the word that was commonly used in the time. He's a coarse-looking man. He's got this big walrus mustache. He's got this sort of rotund physique, and people are constantly referring to his what they call his shapeless hands. When you look at photographs of Grover Cleveland, the hands do look a bit like you know, if a kid were to blow up a surgical glove, <laughs> that's kind of the image that you get. And uh, by all accounts, or I should say by this one account that we have, he actually did have kind of a, a high and, and nasally inflected voice. Ironically, Cleveland is the last president that we do not have a recording of. And if one is to go online, you will find lots of recordings purporting to be of Grover Cleveland. And ironically, they are of William Jennings Bryan's Christ of Gold speech, Bryan being Cleveland's great nemesis within the Democratic Party during his era. In 1894, in the midterms that we're right in the middle of right now, you say the Democrats lost 125 seats in the House, the greatest defeat ever. How did that happen? Well, there are a number of reasons that this happens, and I'll, I'll walk you through them. So part of it is 
uh, as one would expect, a significant public hostility to the Democratic Party that stems from the fact that you are in the midst of what we now know as the Panic of 1893. What they knew at the time as the Great Depression, that was the term that they used for it. Severe economic downturn that has disproportionate effects out in the, the West and the South, where there are a lot of people who are heavily indebted and feel the sting a little bit more acutely than people in the coastal corridors do. There is also uh, surging labor unrest throughout the country. You particularly see this uh, in the form of the Pullman strike in Chicago, what starts off as a fairly modest uh, labor dispute over the railroads, but cascades into a quasi-nationwide shutdown of commerce, which Grover Cleveland then feels compelled to set the federal government to intervene in somewhat controversially within his own party. So there's a real sense of instability in the country at this moment, compounded by the fact that there is a real sense of instability within the Democratic Party. Um, Grover Cleveland is really the last Democratic president accused to the sort of classical liberal Jeffersonian roots of the party, which is to say that he's a constitutionalist. He's a limited government guy. He is, for the most part, laissez-faire. But at the moment that he is president, the Democratic Party, and really the real energy in the Democratic Party, is starting to move towards populism. It's starting to move towards a more aggressive hand for the federal government when it comes to the economy, Uh, a more sweeping sense of power out of Washington. And Cleveland is allergic to this. Cleveland is resisting this at every turn. So you have the Republican Party sort of unilaterally arrayed against the Cleveland administration, and a good chunk of the Democratic Party arrayed against him, too. So he is nobody's favorite come the midterm elections of 1894, or for that matter, really the rest of his presidency and several years after he leaves office. What led to you writing speeches for George W. Bush? You know, I have a very strange backstory where that's concerned. I was hired on the White House staff at the age of 24. And most people, when they hear that datum, assume that I either had an Ivy League education or that I had parents who were, who were donors or something <laughs> the like, uh, neither of which is true. Uh, like many things in my life, it was a matter of pure serendipity. I was in graduate school in my native Southern California at Pepperdine University. And I had a professor there by the name of Bruce Hershenson, who was a former Nixon aide, had run for the Senate in California. We became very good friends. And Bruce, unbidden and without telling me, uh, submitted some work that I had written for his class to Bill McGurn, who at the time was the chief speechwriter in the White House, and told him this is the kind of guy that you should hire to be a White House speechwriter. And about a year later, when a job opened up in the White House, Bill did precisely that. And um, it was it was a very strange experience for a guy from a a fairly obscure corner of of Southern California uh, with no real credentials to his name, certainly none that would unlock the gates of the White House. to then be whisked into that experience all of a sudden. I got the first notification that this was a possibility on a Thursday. And by the next Tuesday, um, I was in the West Wing of the White House being interviewed. How long were you doing speech writing for George W. Bush? And what are your biggest memories from your experience? I was with the Bush administration for a little over a year. I came in in late 2007 and was there through the end of the administration, through Barack Obama's inauguration day. And, you know, my memories of it are probably not the memories that you would think of a White House speechwriter would have, though they were extremely instructive and educational memories. I mean, there are the memories that it, that everybody would have, what it's like to be going into the Oval Office, what it's like to be on Air Force One, of course. But because of the era that I was there, as I say, late 2007 until the Obama inauguration, it was really an education in the limits of the power of presidential rhetoric. Because once you get past the 2006 midterms with pretty sweeping Democratic victories, The country is turned off by the Iraq war at the point that I come in. This is before the surge has really been implemented. And the electricity around the 2008 presidential race, especially between the in the Democratic contest between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. But once we get into the general election, Barack Obama and John McCain and then the 
additional infusion of energy that you get from Sarah Palin being announced as the Republican vice presidential nominee. Well, I got to tell you, the wider world did not care a whole lot about what we were saying in the speechwriting office of the Bush administration, with the single exception of the financial crisis. And there, what you learn is that um, you will be on the hook in perpetuity for things that are sometimes written in, in the course of an hour, you know, because when you have sudden ripples in financial markets or things like that. You don't have time often to sit there and really deliberately think about what these remarks are going to look like. How much during the time of Grover Cleveland as president did financial problems uh, make life difficult for him and the country? Um, not much in his first term, but it is really the dominant theme of his second term. And I will try to explain it as simply as possible, because no audience deserves that a belabored explanation of 19th century American monetary <laughs> policy. But the issue, this goes back to the earlier tension that I raised about the populist versus the classical liberals in the Democratic Party. Cleveland, as I said, being firmly on the classical liberal side. The big push that is happening throughout this era that really comes to a head during Cleveland's second term is the populace wanting the United States to significantly add silver to the money supply. The, the push at its extreme is for free silver. Put as much silver into the money supply as, as you can get, the, the standard otherwise being gold. Why does this matter, especially in the year 2022? What, how can we understand what they were trying to do? Well, the oversimplified version of it, but uh, sufficient enough to get to what the real nub of the issue was, they wanted inflation. And the reason that they wanted inflation was because particularly for the Democratic Party's constituents in the South and in the West, you had lots of people that had moved out to those parts of the country. This is especially true in the West on a wing and a prayer during the homesteading era and had gotten into pretty heavy debt trying to set up their existence on the frontier. And so the prospect of more inflation would have reduced that debt burden. And that's really what they were aiming for. Um, it should be noted, because Grover Cleveland is firmly on the gold side of this, uh, is willing to allow some silver in the money supply. But one of the things that often gets lost when we're talking about this in historical terms the free silver rights are sometimes portrayed as kind of wild-eyed radicals, and many of them were on this issue. That said, there was a germ of truth in what they were saying, in that the gold supplies, when we were on the gold standard, were sufficiently constrained at this time that that was actually slightly deflationary. So their debts were actually becoming more burdensome than they would have been when they were originally contracted for. But this is the central fight in really – the economic chaos of Cleveland's second term is about the market instability. Because you have Cleveland with the Democrats in Congress pulling in different directions on this, nobody knows what is going to happen. Nobody knows if the country is going to stay on the gold standard. Nobody knows if we're going to be flooded with silver. So in many ways, the economic fundamentals matter. But the panic of 1893 is in many ways a panic of psychology. It's just the uncertainty of not knowing how this thing is going to resolve itself that threw the markets into such turmoil. I want to ask you what drew you to Grover Cleveland, but first just to put some numbers on the table. Sure. Uh, in 1884, Cleveland beat James G. Blaine, 4.9 million to 4.8 million. In 1888, the next election, Benjamin Harrison beat Cleveland, although Cleveland, as you all know, got 5.5 million votes and Benjamin Harrison only got 5.4, but he still beat him in the Electoral College. And then Cleveland came back in 1892 and beat Harrison and James Weaver. And in this, all these elections, the number of votes cast nationally in a population of 50 million was around 10 million. Voters were white men only, uh, except in rare cases, a couple of instances. And Grover Cleveland lived... From 1837 to 1908, he was 71 years old when he died. Now to you, what got your attention with Grover Cleveland, and why did you want to spend so much time with him? Well, there were, there were three things, really. The first was a matter of what I consider historical hygiene, 
which is that we have had 45 men be president of the United States. The numbers, by the way, on this are always confusing because of Grover Cleveland. So Joe Biden's the 46th, but it's because we can't go over twice. So you've always got to subtract one from whatever the present number is. But anyway, the important number, 45, 45 men have had the job. Only 14 of them have done a full eight years, so less than a third. And if we were to go down that list, Brian, almost all of them are the household names. But even if you're not an American history buff, you know these guys with almost the single exception of Grover Cleveland. So I just thought it was strange that he had been sort of left out of the historical record, at least as as the layperson is concerned. That was point one. Point two was I thought there was an interesting story to tell here about um, the ideology and the politics of this man as a, as a classical liberal. You know, a few years ago, Anthony Schlades wrote a terrific book about Calvin Coolidge, another sort of classical liberal figure, kind of reviving him for a later era. And I felt like Cleveland deserved that kind of treatment because, um, in a, especially in a moment where classical liberalism doesn't necessarily have a clear home in either political party. It used to be a little more prevalent than the Republican Party seems to be waning right now. I thought it would be interesting for people to have this historical touchstone. But third, I thought even amongst people who considered Cleveland's politics anathema, that this is a story worth telling because Grover Cleveland is in many ways a rebuke to political cynicism. As I mentioned earlier, the entire real sweep of his political career happens in, in the run of three years. I mean, if you locate Grover Cleveland in the year 1881, that is the year that he turns 44 years old. And he is a well-respected, but not especially famous lawyer in Buffalo, New York, certainly not known outside of Buffalo. And in the course of the next three years, he becomes the mayor of the city, the governor of New York, and the president of the United States. And this is all attributable to the fact that he is seen as a man of deep principle and as a man who, in an era when political corruption is really rampant and, and in many cases accepted as the cost of doing business, uh, a man who is, has no willingness to engage in that kind of behavior and, in fact, is forthright about saying it's just as bad coming from my fellow Democrats as it is coming from Republicans. And in a moment like the one we're in now, where I think people feel cynical about American politics, I wanted to present for them the example of this man who shows you that part of the genius of the American system is that moments like that, moments of that kind of civic despair, can yield up an antidote like he was. I want to focus on it. two or three personal stories that you have in the book. Some of them are well known, but you have a lot more specifics than uh, you normally read. And I'll start with Maria Halpin. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a point in your book where you talk about the press trashing him and magazines today trashing him based on a story that you say is not really true. Would you talk through that process and what impact did Maria Halpin have on his first run for the presidency? Yeah, so this is a, a very complicated part of the Cleveland story and has become more complicated in the last decade because, because this story kind of comes in two ways. The first of which is that shortly after Grover Cleveland gets the Democratic presidential nomination in 1884, and remember, as I just said, his nickname at the time is Grover the Good. Everybody thinks of him as this paragon of virtue. And a story breaks shortly after he gets the nomination – suggesting, well, beginning with the general suggestion that he is just a, a man of low character, that he has a severe drinking problem, that he's consorting with prostitutes. But the real meat of the story is that he had fathered a child out of wedlock, this woman in Buffalo by the name of Maria Halpin. Uh, it's likely, actually, as a side note, that her name was probably pronounced Mariah um, under the, the patterns of the day. And what this story alleges is that Cleveland seduces her, gets her pregnant, promises to marry her, does not follow through on that, uh, provides for the child at a distant sort of financial contractual level, but has no real involvement in the child's life. And then ends up uh, a bit annoyed with this ongoing problem and, and the sense that she could potentially be a liability for his political career. And so he has the child abducted from her 
and has her committed to an asylum. The best we can tell, uh, some of the details here are still a little fuzzy, but best we can tell there is some truth to this original story and some falsity. The truth is they did seem to have had a relationship. That seems pretty clear. Cleveland did not deny that. She does seem to have had a child, although there is still some debate as to whether that was Grover Cleveland's child or not. All the evidence around that is circumstantial. Uh, But the most extreme parts of the story were later proved to be untrue. We know that Maria Halpin had a drinking problem. This is something that is recorded even in the stories that were attacking Cleveland over his treatment of her. Those stories also recorded that she had threatened to murder both the baby and Cleveland. So the record suggests that what actually occurred is that Cleveland turned to a friend of his who was a retired judge who sat on the board of the local orphanage and asked her to look in on this child's welfare to make a determination as to whether the child was safe to be with her. The judge determined that the baby was not and convinced Maria Halpin to put the baby up for adoption, at which point she moved to Niagara Falls, started a new life with some money from Grover Cleveland. The story that the newspapers reported, baby is stolen from her, she's put into an asylum, is what happens after this. She comes back, she regrets having given the child up for adoption, so she actually steals him from the orphanage. And then the authorities from the orphanage come back to get the child. This is where the child is abducted from her comes from. And she is put into a sanitarium. She's not being treated for mental illness. She's being treated for the alcohol issues. And she's there voluntarily. She stays there for about 10 days and leaves. So not a story where Grover Cleveland looks like a hero, to be sure. But he was to some degree saved by the fact that the most aggressive parts of it proved to be untrue. And also by the fact that he didn't uh, he, he didn't try to dodge and weave this story. He told his staff, just tell the truth. He really just thought that he had to take his lumps and get through it. Then we get to the rape part of this. The rape part of this really only becomes an issue in the last decade of, of our lives. It starts around 2010. Because of one book, and I I don't want to name the author of the book because this is not personal. This is not about that man or or his work because this could have just been an innocent mistake. But there has been, for the past decade, these stories propagated and then uncritically repeated. That Cleveland actually raped Maria Halpin. That's where this pregnancy had its genesis. So where does this come from? Well, what seems at first like a pretty plausible source which is that several months after the original allegations come out during the presidential election of 1884, with only about a week left in the campaign, another story comes out in which Maria Halpin has supposedly signed an affidavit saying that Grover Cleveland took her against her will and that he threatened her after the fact with ruin if she were ever to go public about it. This seems like a fairly plausible place to get this story from. The problem with the people who have repeated this uncritically over the last decade is that there is another piece of information that they have left out of their accounting of it, which is that just a few days later, another newspaper story runs in which Halpin herself comes forward and says, I did, in fact, sign this affidavit, but I didn't actually read it. And because I had been told that it was to help Grover Cleveland, that it was to express my support for him. I was tricked in this process, and I have nothing negative to say about Mr. Cleveland because all the relevant points have already been discussed, in other words, in the, in the earlier revelations. And so a lot of publications have picked this up and, and run with it, prestigious publications in the last decade or so, just because they don't know that last detail. In your book, though, you, you name names, and you say that Grover Cleveland – Rape allegation has been taken seriously or even embraced uncritically in publications ranging from Newsweek to Salon to The Atlantic. A story at the Daily Beast declared the scandal the most despicable in American political history. A piece at Vice accompanied the headline, Grover Cleveland, a rapist president, with an image of a $1,000 bill on which Cleveland's face appears, flecked with blood. And then you name the man that wrote the book who came from the Daily Beast, Charles Lachman, or Lachman, L-A-C-H-M-A-N, wrote a book called A Secret Lie, The Lies and Scandals of President Grover Cleveland. The reason I name all that is that you say that Cleveland hated the press. I want you to tell us why. (laughs) 
And what would he feel today if he saw how he's been treated in, in the media? Well, he would be horrified. And he, he hated the press in large measure because of this story. He felt that it was deeply invasive. Um, and he obviously was he was wounded by the allegations themselves, but he was wounded by the falsehoods that were sort of woven through them. This is not purely the genesis of his dislike for the press. You can see it a little earlier when he's governor of New York. Um, At one point, he is reacting to stories that are criticizing him for junketeering in Newport, Rhode Island, and noting that in the next column over, there are stories about what he's actually doing as governor in Albany. In other words, he never made the trip to Newport, Rhode Island. The newspaper's own reporting showed that he was at his desk, and he got irritated by this kind of uh, sensationalism. But there's another factor at work, particularly as you get deeper into his presidency, and this seems antique to our modern sensibilities. He kind of exists in the last era where you could plausibly make this argument. He thinks he's a public servant. He doesn't think he's a celebrity. He doesn't think that the president needs to be some national totem. He doesn't feel the need to have some sort of spiritual investment of the, of the country in his presidency. He thinks he's a guy who's doing his job. And thus, he thinks it's uh, invalid and incorrect for the press to be interested in his private life, which they are, especially as you get a couple years into his first term, once he gets married, because Francis Cleveland, his wife, is a huge public sensation. I mean, it's no uh, overstatement to say much more beloved by the public than he himself was. (laughs) And as they add children to the family, there's even more interest on behalf of the press. And this is one of the reasons that during both of his terms in office, uh, he actually removes his family from the White House. They get housing in Washington, and he becomes, for at least parts of the year, sort of a commuter president because he just wants his family away from the prying eyes of the press. And that's now called Cleveland Park? Yes, the, the area that he lived in during his first term is now called Cleveland Park as a result of his his residency there. Go back to the, what you say about the, today's media and the 2011 stories and all that's written. What do you think motivates someone to write, call him a rape, rapist president, uh, other than selling books? Or is that all, what it's all about? I, I have to suspect that that's what it's all about. Although I've got to tell you, Brian, even that doesn't cut much ice with me because it just seems like there are... So, so many more visible figures one, one could pick. You know, if you were if you were just trying to if you're just trying to pull a fast one, get the book on the market, collect the checks before anybody does the work to figure out whether what you said is true or not. Uh, Clover Cleveland would not be my choice. I, I don't think that the the market for those kinds of tawdry tales is that large. But maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I don't know. I know that there is a, a cottage industry of people like this who traffic in this kind of historical revisionism, not particularly well-sourced, but really fallacious. And uh, I suppose it's a living, but I'm at a loss to eke out you know, any, rational, any rationale for it beyond that. Troy Sinek, you have a company called Kite and Key Media? I do. Kite and Key is the product that my co-founder and I are both former think tank executives. We worked together at the Manhattan Institute. I had worked at the Hoover Institution at Stanford some prior to that. And this is a a company that we produce videos. We're an online channel on YouTube and all the other social media platforms um, explaining complicated public policy issues in a way that we hope is compelling for, for lay people because this grew out of a frustration that we had when you work in a think tank. And a big day for you is, you know, a member of Congress takes your idea seriously or one of your scholars gets a piece in the Wall Street Journal. Then it seems like a victory. And then we would both, my partner and I would both go home, talk to family, talk to friends and realize that that sort of work had no influence on how they thought about public policy. What they were getting on public policy was from Facebook or Twitter, or TikTok. And it will probably not surprise you that much of that material is either greatly oversimplified or outright wrong. So we wanted to 
to create a product that was at the intersection of scholarly rigor. We're footnoting everything and pulling from the best work that is being done by think tanks across the political spectrum, government agencies, and also trying to do it in an, in an entertaining way. We just thought there needed to be something that was accessible for normal people, but that took the intellectual rigor seriously so that people could watch a five or six minute video and walk away feeling like they understood the basics of how the national debt works. So they understood the basics of the arguments about renewable energy. That's the idea behind Kite and Key. Where are you headquartered? We are headquartered in New York City, although like many such institutions in the year of our Lord 2022, <laughs> we are heavily remote. We have people all over the country, Connecticut, Texas, California, you name it. And where can the public find it? They can find us at uh, kiteandkeymedia.com, or they can just look for Kite and Key Media on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. How do you make your money? We're a nonprofit organization, which was very, very important to us because we felt that to do this correctly, uh, one basically has to cut against what most of the, the market impulses are for journalism and, and even digital media, digital news explainer stuff because we were not going to be able to do clickbait, nor did we want to. Um, we wanted to do something that was, you know, on a more educational model, something something that was closer to what you created with C-SPAN, something that's closer to a PBS, something that had that sort of sensibility. And so we thought it was very important that we make this a nonprofit and also that we make it a nonprofit where we don't accept any corporate money or, or anything like that, because we really just wanted the ideas to stand for themselves. And it gives us the freedom to experiment and it gives us the freedom to be uh, heterodox, which we are. And where then does the money come from to support your nonprofit? Uh, all of our money comes from either individuals or foundations who, who believe in the mission. Back to um, Grover Cleveland. Two years um, into the presidency, he marries in the White House. You mentioned Francis Folsom earlier. Wars, you did a lot on that story in your book. And what should we know about that story and how important was it to his presidency? It was important to his presidency insofar it was a real shot in the arm for the, the public sentiment around him. As I suggested earlier, it's hard to explain in the modern context just how beloved Francis Cleveland was, especially at a remove, right, in an era where she's only known through journalism. But all the evidence from the time suggests that Francis Cleveland is probably the most popular first lady until you get to Jackie Kennedy. Be, and she's very young when they get married. She is uh, not quite 22 when they're married in 1886 in the White House, as you say. How old is he? He is at that point, let's see, 1886, he would have been uh, 48, 49, right there. There's a big age gap between them. It's the second biggest age gap in uh, presidential history. John Tyler had a slightly larger one with his second wife. And probably the most important thing to note about the marriage between Grover and Francis Cleveland, just because this is another thing that has kind of lodged in the public's head. It is one of the few things that they know about Grover Cleveland, and it, it is at least slightly wrong. So Francis Cleveland is the daughter of Oscar Folsom, who had been Grover Cleveland's best friend and for a time his law partner. And Oscar Folsom is killed in a carriage accident in Buffalo when his daughter Francis is about 11. At which point the courts make Grover Cleveland, the courts make Francis rather Grover's ward, which is a thing you hear a lot in the retelling of this story, with the suggestion that he sort of raised her and the implication that he was grooming her towards being his, his wife. This is not true. Um, in a somewhat unusual arrangement for the day, the the powers conferred on Cleveland by the court were not that different to being essentially the executor of the estate. He had a fiduciary responsibility to Oscar Folsom's widow and his daughter, Frances. But they did not live with him. In fact, for a significant amount of time, they lived in Minnesota while he was in Buffalo. She comes back and eventually is actually engaged to somebody else briefly. Uh, so their courtship really doesn't begin until she's in college, just a few years before they get married. 
And there is a quote that you hear all the time in the telling of this story of Grover Cleveland having supposedly said to his sister years prior to this marriage, when she asked him why he was still a bachelor, I'm just waiting for my wife to grow up. And this is always logged as sort of per se proof that Grover Cleveland had romantic designs on Francis Folsom from the start. But what I found in my research for this book, you can find the document uh, that quote comes from in the Library of Congress, where Grover's sister had recorded it. And there's a very clear timeline in this document that she's writing. And that's a conversation that happens prior to the Civil War, which means it was prior to when Francis Folsom was born. It was probably prior to when Grover Cleveland even knew her father. So his sister retold the story as an ironic connection to the fact that he eventually marries this young, this much younger woman. But in point of fact, he was not talking about Francis when he said it because she hadn't even been born yet. What was Grover Cleveland's relationship with Oscar Folsom's wife, who was Francis Folsom's mother, and close to his age. They had a, a, a close relationship. Uh, the Folsoms, both um, Frances and her mother, were present at the White House on a fairly regular basis prior to the marriage. In fact, the press, to the extent that they cared about Grover Cleveland's love life, which was not much until Frances came along, the press assumed that her mother was the person that he was interested in, <laughs> which would have been the more age-appropriate parent. <laughs> Uh, but they they always seem to have had a good relationship. And you would think, you know, as the living parent, that if there was anything strange or untowards about the relationship, that Francis's mother would have been the most disconcerted by it. But in point of fact, the quotes that we have remaining from her on the matter indicates that she was quite happy uh, that she that, that Francis had regarded, you know, Grover as this important this important man in her life from her childhood had always had this kind of admiration for him. And her mother was unbothered by the fact that as she became an adult, this translated into love. And by all accounts, the Clevelands had, had quite a happy marriage. It ended up yielding um, five children, most of them born after, um, well, two of them, two of the five born after uh, he left the White House. Grover Cleveland had his last child in his mid sixties. You have a footnote that says, the grandson of Grover Cleveland died while you were writing this book. Did you talk to him at any point, and did he have any insight on this marriage? Because he was obviously related. Uh, the person that I referenced in that footnote, I have not had any interaction with. I have had interaction with George Cleveland, uh, another of the president's grandsons, who lives up in New Hampshire, who is a lovely guy, who is the bidding image of Grover Cleveland and as a sort of um, recreation slash side job does Grover Cleveland <laughs> impersonation around uh, around schoolrooms in, in New England. Um, but, you know, the existing um, descendants don't have that much of a connection to him any different than um, a layperson would be because he had children so late in life. I mean, particularly his son, his two sons who were born after he uh, he leaves the White House. They are um, barely teenagers when he passes away. So even though there are living relations to Grover Cleveland, not that many generations removed, they're not people with any real lived experience of him. It's just a function of the age difference between him and, and Francis. Uh, having said that, this is a delicate question. Um, Grover Cleveland was not exactly a matinee idol. Why, why, do, why, why do you think, I mean, what evidence do you have of anything on why Francis Folsom wanted to uh, marry the guy? She was very well, attractive. They, I mean, you've, you've got pictures in your book about it, and she was very attractive. And, of course, and, you know and, and, and renowned for her beauty at the time. I mean, the the book is rotten with these quotes from the press at the time, fawning over her, comparing her to a Greek goddess and the like. I mean, this was ubiquitous at the time. Well, I don't know, Brian. They say there's a lid for every pot, right? <laughs> I mean, I, my Here, at the risk of psychoanalyzing, because I really try not to, in the book, go beyond where the evidence will take us, but you know, this is a woman who lost her father at a young age, and she has this proxy of a man who, 
not only has a cast a kind of paternal figure, but also was was close to her father. And uh, there's been a lot of writing on this over the years, some of it, I think, quite irresponsible. But I think it's it's certainly legitimate to conjecture that there was some sort of parallel track here that was both sort of romantic and, and, and familial. So you are entirely right in terms of just the, the physical mismatch of these two. I mean, you want to talk about a guy, to use the modern parlance, a guy who outkicked his coverage. Grover <laughs> Cleveland is one of them. <laughs> Chapter 13. Uh, it's one of my favorite stories of all time in politics, and I want you to go into some detail with it. As you know, it's the uh, headline, How Weak the Strongest Man, mm. the story of his cancer operation... <laughs> Tell us, start talking. <laughs> Tell us about it. <laughs> so in, in 1893, which is at the very start of Cleveland's second term, by which point the economy is already starting to enter into a tailspin, Cleveland detects a, what is, is referred to at the time as an ulcer, but there's a tumor in the top of his mouth. Uh, Cleveland was a pretty regular cigar smoker. Cleveland... Um, was a pretty, pretty regular tobacco chewer. And this puts Cleveland in a bind because upon medical inspection, he is told by almost everybody involved, you have to remove this thing. Um, his, his doctor tells him, were it in my mouth, I would remove it immediately. Um, immediately is not an option for him because at the moment he's trying to navigate this financial crisis. And the stakes here are pretty high. Because if Cleveland has something that proves to be fatal, which for all he knows at this point he might, his vice president, Adlai Stevenson, who is the grandfather of the Adlai Stevenson we know as the Democratic presidential nominee from the 50s, was on the opposite side of the monetary issues he was. Uh, Stevenson was a, a free silver guy. So you want to unsettle the markets even more in this moment, tell them that the president of the United States may be about to drop dead and the entire policy course may go in the opposite direction. So an arrangement is made for Cleveland to have a surgery at sea. And the reason that the surgery is done at sea is it's the only place where they can get enough space to meet their medical needs and have enough privacy to meet their political needs. So Cleveland is ferried up to New York. The reason he can get away with this, by the way, this is in the summer of 1893. In this era, the Congress is not present for most of the summer. Cleveland himself had a long habit of repairing to a vacation home that he had on Cape Cod during the summer. And indeed, that becomes the pretense for this entire endeavor. He goes up to Manhattan under the cover story that he is going to be traveling on the yacht of his friend, E.C. Benedict, who is a prestigious New York financier, and that the yacht is going to ferry him from Manhattan up to Cape Cod. They keep the doctors all below decks as they're going up the East River so they won't be recognized by people from the law. From the local hospitals, and as they turn up into Long Island Sound, they begin this surgical procedure um, described, you know, quite vividly in the book, where they essentially have to take Cleveland into the empty salon of a yacht, tie him to a chair, go in, remove part of his jaw, remove several of his teeth, cut into the the roof of his mouth, and the entire procedure takes about. 90 minutes, when you sort of read the after-action report, it, it can seem, if you were just to read the top-line summary, um, uneventful as such things go. But it really is not when you get into the details. I mean, there is a moment in the surgery when he starts to regain consciousness, and they have to hit him with a, another round of anesthesia. By the way, up to this point, no president had ever even been put under while they were in office. And the, the surgery ends up going off mostly without a hitch, except that there's a pretty big problem in the after effects, which is that as he's recovering, they have to stuff his mouth full of gauze. And the reporting from the doctors at the time is that with the gauze in his mouth, his speaking was labored, but you could sort of understand him. When they took the gauze out, they, they compare it to the worst imaginable, imaginable case of cleft palate. You can't understand that the president of the United States, which is a real problem. And they end up enlisting a dentist from New York who creates a prosthesis out of vulcanized rubber that Cleveland carries with him in his mouth for the rest of his life that 
restores the shape of his jaw because it, it didn't look quite right and allows him to speak pretty close to how he had before. But at the time, every single aspect of this is covered up. They don't want it out to anybody. The only people who know are his wife and the members of the medical team aboard the boat and his secretary of war, who had previously been his personal assistant, who was a part of this. Eventually, they tell the attorney general as well. But they don't tell the vice president. And the president is going under the knife. And they almost have their cover blown because a dentist, the dentist who was participating in the surgery had missed a subsequent appointment in Connecticut. Reason being the doctor who supervised everything didn't want to let him off the boat because he thought Cleveland might have to have more work done. So this dentist shows up in Greenwich, Connecticut, where he was supposed to have performed this procedure, has to come up with a reason for why he didn't show up until a day later, and proceeds to spill the beans on everything. Tells the guy he's working with exactly what had happened, which ends up getting to a political reporter who then gets the story into the newspapers. And the only reason that this doesn't totally blow up in the moment is that by the time the story is fully developed, Cleveland has gone back to Washington. He seems normal. The surgery was done in such a way that he didn't have to remove his mustache. The shape of his face looks the same. And also one of the stewards on board the boat, uh, not clear whether this was prompted or not or whether he was just trying to be a team player, tells the press, no, the president walked the decks of the boat every day. Nothing happened. The official cover story was he just had some dental work. And then other stories come and, and knock this off the front pages. And it, it becomes the case that the, the journalist who writes this story does not get vindicated until uh, over 20 years later. When it finally, after Grover Cleveland has passed, Francis Cleveland allows one of the doctors who was involved in the procedure to tell the truth, which the journalist who had reported on it had gotten almost completely right. Well, at the time it was published, um, how much, how many, I know it was in a Philadelphia newspaper initially, how many other papers ran it? Did you get any sense of how broad the story was? It ran in a number of places, and um, it certainly was not limited to this, to this one paper. What I found interesting in researching the mechanics of the political fallout from this is that Cleveland goes up to his house in Cape Cod. That's where they deposit him after he's had the surgery. And the press corps is up there, as they would be today. The president's away for summer vacation. You send the press corps out to where the president is vacationing. And there are questions, because nobody has seen him since he came back from what was supposed to just be a dental procedure. And the story given to the president is, well, he has rheumatism. And an aide, one of the president's aides, comes out to a barn so that the reporters can't see the house because Cleveland, we know, is in the house in a bathroom at that point. I mean, he's not, he's not moving around. And convinces the press that all the rumors about Cleveland's health are actually being spread by his opponents. You guys are, you guys are being duped by people who are peddling this stuff for political purposes. And what I found so interesting about the way that this plays out is the press corps at Gray Gables, which was the name of Cleveland's estate in Cape Cod, uh, had an understanding with each other that on stories like this, they would make a decision as a collective what version they were going to run with. They felt the need to be in accord on what they were reporting. And the testimony we have from the Times suggests that the people who thought that the Cleveland staffers were telling the truth, and the balance here was probably tipped by the fact that Cleveland had this reputation for honesty— the people who believed the administration slightly outweighed the people who didn't. And so they all came to the agreement that, well, we're all going to run the same story, which is that these are lies. Grover Cleveland was telling the truth. He just had some dental work. It was remarkable to see the press move as a pack like that in a way that for each of their individual competitive purposes, you know, you would think would be harmful, would be the wrong incentive. What impact did his dislike for the press have on his two presidencies? I don't know. I don't know that it had it had less of an impact on his presidency than it did on his uh, political campaign, by which I mean Cleveland, even in the late 19th century, is a little bit of a man out of time insofar as, you know, you hear this sometimes about Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill seems old-fashioned, and you have to understand that he was actually old-fashioned in his own era. 
Um, there's a little bit of that in Cleveland. Insofar as the three times that he runs for president, as I alluded to earlier, he doesn't do much. He gives a couple of speeches. He deputizes uh, other people to go out on the stump for the most part. While on the other side of the uh, ballot, you've got, I mean, in 1888, you've got Benjamin Harrison doing these speeches in front of his home in Indianapolis to huge crowds and then having this remarkably sophisticated and sort of proto-modern campaign organization circulating this stuff and distributing it throughout the country. And, you know, Cleveland is is not that guy. He is, he is not temperamentally that guy. Um, he doesn't seem to have ever really enjoyed making speeches. He doesn't really seem to have placed much stock in, in charisma and doesn't seem to have really had any, at least as we define it in the context of a contemporary politician. And also it just seems, it seems like vaudeville to him. It seems like things that are unbefitting um, a president. But as I say, this is only po- he is in the last moment in American politics where it is possible to really think of it that way. And even his aides are trying to tell him consistently, this is probably not sustainable. You probably have to get out there a little bit more. You probably have to do build the machinery of a, of a modern campaign. Just a reminder, 1884 was his first term and 1892 was his second. And the reason I mentioned that during the Civil War, he paid someone to take his place in the military in the Civil War. Why didn't that have any more impact than it apparently did? I think what the price at that time was $150. That, that's what he had to pay. That's right. He paid a, a Polish sailor by the name of George Beninsky. Um, this was perfectly legal. This was a legal arrangement at the time that if you were drafted as he was and you weren't able to go, didn't want to go, in Cleveland's case, uh, I, we don't really have any record of his feelings about the prospect of serving. What we do know is that there was a financial imperative here because he, um, his mother was a widow. His father had died when he was 16. And there were nine children, four boys, five girls. And at the time of the Civil War, two of Cleveland's brothers had served in the Union military. There was him, who by this point, he's the assistant district attorney in Erie County, New York, and then there's a brother on Long Island who's a minister and not bringing in very much money. And so the older Cleveland boys are responsible for the financial livelihood of their mother and their younger sisters. This seems to have been the controlling factor in why he chose not to go and, and pay a substitute. It was used against him when he ran. And I've been asked this by a number of people because it with its echoes of you know the draft dodging allegations against Bill Clinton in the 90s or the criticisms of Donald Trump for not going to Vietnam because of the bone spurs. Why didn't this have more legs in its era? I don't know the answer to that question, but I can offer you an educated guess uh, because I couldn't find explicit reference to this anywhere. But remember where Grover Cleveland's Democratic Party is in the, in the 1880s, in 1884, when he's first running. You're only at this point 20 years, not quite 20 years removed from the end of the Civil War. The Democratic Party has been shut out of everything at the federal level. They have not won a presidential election since 1856. And a big part of this is that they are shouldering this albatross of the Civil War and being thought of as the party of the Confederacy. And the Republicans, you know, waving the bloody flag, as they say, reminding everybody that the Democrats were the party of the Confederacy, the Democrats were the party of slavery, the Democrats were the party of the South. I think the reason this doesn't stick as much to Grover Cleveland was to advance this story, you would be underlining the fact that Grover Cleveland was a Northern Democrat from New York with brothers serving in the Union Army. So, While the the core story seems like it would be politically advantageous, it also brings up a lot of overtones that might not have been that helpful for Republicans to remind voters of. Running out of time. And by the way, I have not concentrated much on what he actually did in in policy and all that. People can read that in the book. But the personal stuff seemed to be... uh, very interesting and and separate from that. But the the one I want to ask you about this he he had five hundred and eighty four vetoes <laughs> during his two terms. How did that fit with other presidents? 
He has 584 vetoes in two terms. He has 414 in the first term alone, which is more than all 21 presidents prior to him combined. And the 584 total from the two terms is still um, second of all time, only behind Franklin Roosevelt. And Franklin Roosevelt had to do more than two terms to get to it. I mean, so you, it's kind of a revolution in the, in the use of the veto power. And this all comes down to the fact that Grover Cleveland, in, really, in many ways, really considers the role of the presidency to be a kind of ombudsman def- defending the citizens against the actions of the legislature and thinks that the legislature is being spendthrift on a lot of issues. This is, a lot of this has to do with things like military pensions and the like. And that's where you get this huge passel of vetoes. It's one of the things that is just consistent throughout his career. He says this explicitly, is that any time the government takes one red cent beyond what is needed to carry out their poor responsibilities, that is tantamount to theft. And that is one of the reasons that he is so aggressive in his use of the veto pen. By the way, I don't know whether I read it in your book or someplace else that uh, there was plans at some point to have a presidential, small presidential library in Caldwell, New Jersey, where he was born. Is that still on track? Yes. So it's interesting that you asked that question. I reference in my book the only place that you can go, apart from his gravesite, to learn about Grover Cleveland is his birthplace in Caldwell, New Jersey. About 15 years ago, there was a proposal to create a Grover Cleveland presidential library in Buffalo. Um, that would have used a literal library, an old public library was to be repurposed for this, fell apart. But I've just been told within the past few weeks um, by members of the board at the Grover Cleveland birthplace in Caldwell that I think they are actually now moving forward with plans to transform that into not just the birthplace, but also within the next few years, a Grover Cleveland presidential library. Last question to you. Uh, How long did you spend with Newt Gingrich, and what did you do for him, and what was that experience like? Uh, My experience with Newt was was very brief. It was while I was a graduate student. I was not a speechwriter for him. This was prior to me going into the Bush White House. I was working on um, radio addresses. He he used to do these radio addresses, somewhat modeled after the, uh, the Ronald Reagan radio addresses that famously were a part of his political rise. And uh, it was a fascinating experience. It was a fascinating experience because, you know, speech writing is always a reflection of who you're working for. That's whose head you're trying to get inside. And Newt's head is very, very different than George W. Bush's head or, or Arnold Schwarzenegger's head, who I always, always worked for. You just never knew what he was going to draw inspiration from. And sometimes it was – I'm not making this example up. Sometimes it was a, it was a Boy Scout manual from 1907. He would find something in there that he thought was the secret to some policy discussion. So it was it was endlessly interesting. You never knew what the next day was going to bring. Some background on Troy Sinek. He was born in Fullerton, California, grew up in Riverside, California, and Costa Mesa. And he has a bachelor's degree in political science and philosophy at Belmont University in Nashville. And he holds a master's degree in public policy from Pepperdine, as he said earlier, in Malibu with concentrations in economics and foreign policy. Do you intend to write another book? I'm not sure that my wife will permit that, Brian. Mm. <laughs> this was, I made, I made the grave mistake of taking on a, a pretty heavily researched book at the same time as starting uh, a new company, and that was probably ill-advised. But I have to say, once it was all over, I, I really enjoyed the process. Uh, the answer to that question is probably contingent on If I could find another subject that I felt like was as interesting and as underappreciated as Grover Cleveland, I don't think the world needs any more, you know, Tay Roosevelt or Abe Lincoln books, even though I love many of them. I'm sort of more interested in these figures that have been, to my mind, sort of unjustly marginalized when we're telling ourselves the story of what America has been. Troy Sinek's business is called Kite and Key Media. You can find public information on there at KiteandKeyMedia.com. And the name of the book, again, is A Man of Iron, The Turbulent Life and Improbable Presidency of Grover Cleveland. Troy Sinek, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Brian. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus, and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode. Questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts 
at c-span.org.